Hi, I'm Patty with Harris County Precinct 4 Encore. We're here on another Encore excursion at the Museum of the American GI in College Station, where we're learning more about the history of the American military and servicemen. Welcome to the Museum of the American GI. I'm Leisha, I'm the museum director, and I'm also one of the founding board members. So we hope you're gonna enjoy our tour of the museum. Let me tell you a little bit about the history of the museum. The museum was founded as a 501c3 or a nonprofit in 2001. We do everything a little bit backwards here at the museum. We started out with a award-winning collection of military vehicles and uniforms, and then we decided that we wanted to share that with the public. So my husband and I and another person were the founding members. And so again, the idea of the museum started in 2001, and we were able to acquire the property soon after that the museum building is on. It took us a while to um, raise the funds to put the building up because we do everything pay as you go. So we eventually got the money to start this building and so this building that we're going to be in right today and that we're going to go and show you things has been open for six years this coming Thanksgiving. So as you can see when we go through it there's still some things that we're working on but again hopefully by the time you're able to come in and visit us everything on the inside of the museum is going to be all finished and so you're going to have a wonderful experience when you come. The vehicle that we have right here is a Vietnam era Antos. It was used by both the Army and the Marine Corps. Used principally by the Marine Corps, I believe, but this one is painted up for the Marine Corps. So it was essentially a mobile gun platform. They could um, go into the jungle and fire all the weapons. What makes this one unique is it has six 106 recoilless rifles on it and they could be fired simultaneously or individually. It would have a crew of two, the person in the front um, could see out to drive it and the person at the back um, um, does all the weapons. Now, what's interesting about this is you can't load it from the inside. Most of our, like World War II or other vehicles, you could load from the inside. This one requires the person to be outside. They have to come in and load the um, weapons, and then they could get inside and fire it, but they have to be outside exposed to be able to load it up. So again, they would load it, probably go off and do their mission and support the Marines in the jungle. And it was a quite effective um, piece of equipment at that time to help in the jungle because the way that it was worked, it could really knock trees down and get in places other vehicles could not. This is tour guide Annie. When you come to visit the museum, she takes you around and shows you everything. So she's gonna be in here on one of our tanks that we restored. This is a French Renault tank. It's 100 years old. It was used in World War I. Now, the, this is the only operational tank of its type in North America. There's only about less than 10 of them that work worldwide. So the museum, everything that we have um, is fully functional. It's been fully restored in oper so it, to com complete operation. So what we end up having to do on this, these tanks never, or the vehicles never look like this when we get them. They are all rusty, lots of parts are missing, and so we have to bring them in and restore them to the condition that they look like today, which is what we call factory condition, like they would roll out of the factory. So this particular one was a kind of rusty hulk. The good thing about it, it belonged to one family. They had it for um, almost the whole time from after World War I. So when we go to restore things, we have to assess it and repair the damage, and then there's lots of parts missing. So people often ask us, where do we get the parts? Well, we get them in a lot of places. One of the things we have to do is hunt around, and we get all the manuals. We have to hunt and find the ones. So this particular tank, it required us to work with people from France and England because they were working. We had other people that were restoring their tanks as well. So between the three of us in three different countries, we were able to get together and what our tank had, theirs didn't, what their tank had ours didn't and we were able to combine it together and put it together. We also require a lot of special expertise like um, if we have to do anything these are wooden wheels and so that's not something that's normally done around here so on um, this case we actually had to send these wheels to France 
back to France to have somebody work on them. And in the end, it just requires a lot of hard work. Typically, from the start to finish, it takes us over two years to restore every vehicle. So we have a Cobra helicopter in the museum. It is a Vietnam era Cobra. This was the first attack helicopter that the US military had. It was dedicated to support ground troops. Uh, most people are familiar with the Huey helicopter. They don't think too much about um, that in Vietnam we had other helicopters, but this particular one is a Cobra. So um, this one is dedicated to Robert Acklam, who is one of the most um, de um, decorated Aggie alumni. In a 30-month period, he received more accolades and awards than almost any other um, person that was a, a former student from, from A&M. Now, there's an interesting story with Robert Acklam that he was supporting a, some ground troops in a uh, mission. His helicopter was shot down. He broke his back. They assumed that he would never walk again. He learned to walk again. In fact, he went back into the Army and he graduated from Ranger School and actually deployed as an Army Ranger. So it's just a testament to the veracity and the tenacity of our military that they don't like to give up. So Robert Acklin never gave up. Now on these helicopters, the Cobra itself um, was used initially by the Army. Um, the Army replaced it with the Apache. The Cobras then went to the Marine Corps and just in the past few years did the Marine Corps retire the Cobras. This is our river patrol boat. It was used in Vietnam. It was considered what it, the people that were on it were part of the Brown Water Navy or the River Rats. The reason Brown Water Navy, because they went up and down the river. Um, it's also green, which is different than what you would normally think of a Navy boat, which you think of it being you know, gray or silver, but again, it provided good camouflage in the jungles of the river. Now, the gentlemen that served on this, they either loved it or hated it. They loved it because when it got up to full speed, it lifts out of the water and the jet engines at the back going, it lifts out of the water and it says it can go in two feet deep of water. Now, the guys that were on it, they tell me two feet, nah, we took it in nine inches of water. So they really loved it. Now, the reason that they didn't like being on it is to be able to build up that speed. This is not armored, it's aluminum. So it was also a bullet magnet. And so just think about being in this and being fired at. So you don't have much protection. But the, the boat itself, it has two um, twin 50 caliber machine guns at the front, them at the back, and a, um, a launch for a um, rocket um, little mortar type thing and so people loved it. They, it was either great but again it went up and down the Mekong Delta patrolling to make sure that the little boats that were there were just doing what they were supposed to be doing and not um, taking any contraband weapons. So again Vietnam era and um, ex wonderful example of a Navy vehicle that's small enough to go into our museum. A lot of people think of our museum as being the tank museum. That's what I have a lot of people say, oh, I want to go to the tank museum. Well, we do have lots of tanks, but we're also fortunate that we have things from World War I all the way to um, more recent vehicles. And so this is an example of one of our World War I vehicles. Most people don't think about it because um, we're used to having cars and um, things like that going around, but World War I was the first modern war. It was the first modern war because it's the first one to have um, trucks and was the first introduction of tanks. But not every place could we, we didn't have good road systems. Not every place we could go could we use the, the vehicles. So one of the stalwarts of our um, military was using these wagons. This is called an escort wagon. It could be used for lots of purposes. Um, rarely was it used to take people around, but it could be used to carry ammunition from one place to the other, to bring supplies to the front lines and those types of things. A lot of times people thought being in uh, the escort wagon, being behind the lines was a plum um, position to be in because no one, who's gonna shoot at a wagon? Well, actually, 
a lot of people shoot at the wagon. It was sometimes safer to maybe be in the trench because the enemy artillery knew if they could knock out these wagons on their way to the front lines, they could get rid of the, the supplies to the front line. So these guys came under lots of fire, and but they um, used the wagon. So this particular wagon could be set up for a team of two or a team of four. Now, typically we think about horses, but it was normally mules, a team of two or four mules on it. So when people come visit the museum, I often ask them, what are the most recognizable vehicles that you think of when you think of World War II? People always say a Jeep and a Sherman tank. Well, this is a Sherman tank. So the museum is fortunate. We have two examples of Sherman tank on display here at the museum. We actually have a third one that we bring out for special events. So we have three working Shermans, but only two on display. So what makes the Sherman tank unique is the fact that this was the workhorse of the American military in World War II. It is considered a medium tank. I know it doesn't look like a medium tank. It looks pretty heavy, but it was a medium tank because of the thickness of the armor on it. It came in lots of different, slightly different variations, but what made the Sherman tank so unique or wonderful for the Americans was the unique ingenuity that went into making the tanks because all the parts were interchangeable. That's what made our tanks a little bit easier to work with in the field than let's say the German tanks because the German tanks were a little over engineered but our tanks weren't so if this tank was disabled but this front differential was still good we could just drop it off of this tank and put it on another one and the tank would work great so it was all the parts were interchangeable now this tank had five people in it looks kind of cramped but there would be five people in it and um, so we'd have the driver the co-driver and about three people in the back one of the interesting things about this tank is it has a the cannon in it it's a 75 millimeter howitzer cannon and this is a 75 millimeter shell now sometimes depending on who we have coming in I'll let them pick it up so they can see how heavy it is so just think about this you're inside that and you're constantly lifting this up and you're firing it. So that took a lot of work to utilize this tank. Now for the museum, all of our cannons work, but we fire blanks. So we don't fire any projectiles out the front, but we just fire the blanks. One of the cool things about this tank is if you're looking at it, you can kind of see at some point that we have up armor on it. So there's some up armor here on the side in two places, but notice this little up armor here on the side, there's a star on it. Now, why would we put up armor on a tank? Well, that's because behind that tank is either a person or there's ammunition that we want to protect. So we put a little bit of extra armor on it, but in all the wisdom, they painted a star on it. So now let's think about it. The Germans are far off, they're the artillery. They see a Sherman tank coming up, they're gonna fire at the tank. What are they gonna side in on? That star. So in the field, a lot of times the people um, in the, the Sherman crews would get dirt and cover up the star or hang bags on it, whatever they could do. But on the whole, this was a wonderful tank that the United States had and it's a classic example of a medium tank used in World War II. Right back here, we have one of the unique things that we have at the museum. A lot of people miss it when they come in, so we have to point it out. So then the next question I always ask people after they see it is, what do you think it is? No one ever gets it. So then we go on, it's a drone. And they go, hmm, what do you do with a drone? Well, you use it to drop bombs with or your communications. No, you don't. So I'm gonna give you the secret. So when you visit the museum, you'll already know the answer to it. So, it was a World War II drone, but it wasn't used to drop bombs or for communication. So let me ask you a question. How do you learn how to shoot down a plane? You shoot down a plane. So this was used to train our anti-aircraft gunners um, in the war, so that way they would be good at shooting down the planes. Now before we came up with this, there was another way of doing that. They had tow behind targets, so people would fly a plane with a tow behind target. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that pilot that's flying that plane that they're shooting at the tow behind target. So this was a much safer way for our anti-aircraft gunners to learn how to do it. Now there is an interesting story with this. So on this um, 
drone, they were mostly um, developed or, or put together in California. Ronald Reagan was in charge of the motion picture division of the Army in World War II. Now, they didn't make movies. They did training films and things like that. So he sent a photographer out to the drone factory and said, take a picture of all the pretty Rosie the Riveters that were working on the um, plane or the drone so that way we could put it in the Yank magazine, which was a magazine they sent out to the um, soldiers in World War II. So that's what the um, photographer did. He found this one young woman that he thought was extremely photogenic. In fact, he told her, he said, you know, you're so photogenic, you should be a model. I'll come back and I'll take your pictures and help you develop your portfolio. So the woman thought about it and thought about it and says, hmm, you know, maybe being a model is much better than working on the drone factory. So she said, okay, I'll go for it. She dyed her hair, changed her name, and that was how Marilyn Monroe was discovered at a drone factory in California working on the World War II drones. The museum is fortunate to be home to the Texas Vietnam Heroes exhibit. On this exhibit, there's 3,417 dog tags, one for every Texas veteran that was killed or missing in action in Vietnam. The silver dog tags are the ones that were killed in action. The black are the ones that are missing in action. Now, we do have three black dog tags that have gold ribbons around them because those are for three of our soldiers whose remains were um, recovered and they were repatriated to the United States. So they're no longer missing, but they still have the black dog tag. Now these dog tags are unique. They were made on a Vietnam era dog tag machine. They were each hand embossed by a Vietnam era veteran, Don Dorsey, who was a Vietnam um, Marine Scout sniper. There were only two dog tags made. One is on display here at the museum. The other is entombed in the base of the Vietnam Memorial at the state capitol. Now these dog tags are a little bit different than the dog tags that would have been worn by the soldiers because on these dog tags it has the person's name, their um, uh, rank, and the military branch that they were in. So. USA, US Army. It also has a date, and that is the date that they were missing in action or killed in action. And it also has their hometown. So this is all a little bit of different information than's normally on the dog tag. But again, it's meant to be a visual representation of the sacrifices that our military makes. It's a, also it's designed so it's tactile, people can touch it. So we want uh, particularly our young people that come through the museum to understand that not everybody that goes um, off to war comes home, that there is a sacrifice um, to that and these people are willing to make it, but that's why we honor our military because of that willingness that they have to make that sacrifice for us. Thank you for joining us on another exciting Encore excursion. We'll see you on the next trip.